I have this beautiful piece of old yellow gum wood that we'd like to make into a table. But firstly, I need some skills to work out how I'm going to get this to look like a nice piece of furniture. To do that, I need some individual skills. I need to be able to learn how to sand the wood. I need to learn how to be able to fill. I need to learn how to join wood together. And also, I need to have an overall picture of what I'm trying to build. The same applies when you're trying to build a table tennis game. You need to think about the individual skills that you're going to have to build up to develop your overall game. Welcome to the Ping Skills Table Tennis Show. This week, our main story is on the building blocks of table tennis. We show you the seven important blocks that you need to develop a very good table tennis game. Plus, we'll have our usual segments, the tip of the week, the drill of the week, and remember when. Enjoy the show. We've broken the building blocks down into seven blocks. The first block is your basic strokes. The second block is linking those basic strokes together. Thirdly, we're going to randomise those strokes. Fourthly, we're going to work on our serving and receiving of serve. Fifthly, we're going to do some match drills. Sixth, some match play. And finally, the seventh block is the psychology of table tennis. But through your table tennis life, you're always jumping backwards and forwards through those levels. It's about building those blocks and then going back and making each level stronger. Let's take a look at building block one, your basic strokes. Firstly, it's important to know how to hold the bat correctly. Get a grip. Secondly, we talk about the most important skill, and that is to be able to just control the ball backwards and forwards on the table and develop that control. Then we move into our strokes. We can start with the forehand counter hit and then perhaps the backhand counter hit. It doesn't matter too much the order of these two strokes. Then in our first building block, we start to think about the push stroke, where we're introducing a little bit of backspin. Again, it could be forehand push and backhand push that we work on. The order isn't important, but I find the backhand push is probably an easier stroke to learn. The next step in our first building block is the top spin and the block strokes. So now we're starting to increase the top spin and we're also learning how to block at the same time. We can do this on the forehand or we can do this on the backhand. <laughs> the final step in that first building block is the top spin against backspin. You can do it on the forehand or the backhand. In that first building block, we're building those basic strokes. The forehand and backhand counter hit, the forehand and backhand push, the forehand and backhand topspin against block, and the forehand and backhand topspin against backspin. So within that, we're also starting to learn about spin. Topspin and backspin. Building block two is about linking those basic strokes together. We're talking about some basic linking of a forehand and a backhand. This is important because in a game situation, we don't play just one stroke at a time. It's about moving and playing those strokes correctly. If you're just playing forehands, your bat is moving straight back into the forehand ready position. But when you're starting to link strokes, your bat is moving from a different position. So it's moving from here over to here to play a forehand. It's a very different pattern. Part of this level is about your movement as well. It's about thinking about your footwork and your basic stance. So 
So now when we're doing one forehand and backhand, you'll see that I need to also implement my footwork so that I get into position to play my stroke. Building block two is about linking. It's about playing your strokes when starting and moving from different positions. Building block three now is about randomising the ball. In building block two, we were moving and playing the ball when moving from different positions. But in a game situation, we don't know where the next ball is going to be. If Jeff starts to randomise where the ball's coming, then I need to start to watch the ball more carefully. Initially, when you're randomising the drill, what you could do is perhaps do 80% of the balls coming to my backhand, so I'm fairly comfortable, and then 20% going to my forehand. So I still need to be aware of where that ball's coming and watching all the time. Pretty quickly, you can build it up into a 50-50 drill where the ball can come either to my forehand or my backhand and I really need to watch where that ball's coming. You could do the double trouble drill where Jeff is going to put either one or two balls to my backhand and then one or two balls to my forehand. So what happens here is that if Jeff has put two balls to my forehand side or my backhand side, then I know where that next ball is going to come. I know he has to switch. So it's a bit of a combination between knowing where the ball's coming and not knowing where the ball's coming. So it's a partial random drill. This is an important step in your learning process and a really important building block that a lot of players forget about. It's easy to start to randomise your drill. Even if you're doing some set drills like the Falkenberg drill of one backhand, forehand from the backhand corner and forehand from the forehand corner, you can then get your training partner to every now and then throw in a ball outside of that pattern. So start to randomise your drills and then eventually do a lot of totally random drills where you don't know where any ball is coming. We all know the feeling of being able to play a stroke really well, but then when it comes to a game situation, suddenly that stroke breaks down. Randomising in training is the way that you're going to help yourself to implement your strokes into a game situation more easily. Building block four is all about service and return. Wow, did you see how far that ball spun off? Serving and receiving is building block four in our game. This is a really important part because it now starts to really get to the pointy end of spin. The first time you try to return a spin serve, it can be really baffling. One flies off one way, another one flies off the other way, and it's really hard to tell the difference. The good news is, that there are some simple steps that you can follow to help you to understand what is happening with those serves. The key is to know what to look for. We've got lots of information in our Receiving Secrets course. A good tip to start with is to get someone to serve the same serve to you 10 times in a row. The first time you try and return it, the ball might fly right off the end of the table. But by adjusting the angle of your racket, you can start to get that ball closer to the table, adjust it a little bit more, it goes on the table, and now adjust it a little bit more, and you can return it to where you want the ball to go. Once you're comfortable with that, you can then start to get them to mix up the spins. We have lots of information in our Receiving Secrets course. Of course, your mind will then turn to, how can I do those serves? There are lots of options with your serving, but a couple of simple ones to learn to start with are the pendulum serve, then you can try the tomahawk serve, and the backhand serve. Every point starts with a serve and a receive. 
So this building block is an important part to put in place. We have tips on these and a lot more in our Serving Secrets course. Our fifth building block is match drills. So match drills are now starting to combine our serving and receiving with our basic strokes. This starts to get a little bit closer to a match type situation. Match drills focus on the first three balls in the rally. The serve, the return of serve, and then the next ball. These are really important because, again, each rally starts with that. And the type of spin that's on the ball changes all the time. Just being able to play your strokes is good, but being able to adapt them and adjust to the different types of spins is important into the match situation. You can invent lots of different match drills. You can work on your flick or your short pushing or your forehand topspin or backhand topspin. The important part here though is that the match drill starts with a proper serve and return of serve. One simple example of a match drill is I'm going to do a pendulum short serve, Jeff's going to push the ball long to my forehand and I'm going to make a forehand topspin to his backhand. After that, the rally is free. The building block of our match drills pulls together our serving, receiving and our basic strokes into a rally. Building block six is all about match play. Our sixth building block is match play. Now we're talking about not just rallies, but we're talking about how do you put those strokes, serves, returns of serve into a match situation and implement them. How do you do that? You can do it with your friend in a training situation, but we really recommend that you can try and find a group, a club that you can join so that you have a wide variety of players that you can play with. Join into a league or fixtures or pennant and even enter some tournaments. Now, this isn't something that you need to wait five years to do. It's something that we encourage you to do fairly early on. Learn those basic skills, learn some serves and returns of serve, but then put yourself out there, enter into some leagues and start to play some matches because you'll learn a whole lot by doing that. Our seventh building block is the psychology of table tennis. Now, it is the seventh block, but it is an integral part of the game. Without it, it makes it very difficult to win matches. We often see that you can tell who's going to win a match, not by their forehands or backhands, but just by how well they manage themselves on the court. Psychology is an underutilised area of the game. It doesn't only apply to the players at the top level in the world, it applies to every table tennis player. And managing the psychology of table tennis can really help every player to improve their level. Psychology is a big topic and it's really difficult to know where to start. The easiest way is to first up, recognise your feelings. Think about the feelings that you get in a match situation. When it gets close, how do you feel? When you're playing well, how does it feel? The next thing is to think about the tools that you can utilise to help you to manage your feelings. By managing your feelings, you'll start to be able to play good table tennis more often. One simple tool is a pre-point routine. If you watch the top players, you'll notice that they're doing something similar before every point that they play. This is their pre-point routine. So why do they do it? It's just so that they can become more comfortable and in any situation, they can fall back to that comfortable pre-point routine. I encourage you to develop your own pre-point routine. For more help on psychology, go to the sports psychology section on the site. We've now been through our seven building blocks our basic strokes, linking the strokes, randomising the strokes, 
introducing serving and receiving, doing our match drills, involving yourself in match play, and then examining the psychology of table tennis. Even though you've now been through those seven blocks, it's important to always go back and make each block stronger. That way, you will start to build a very powerful game. Our tip of the week is to start to utilise the backhand side spin flick to put you into an attacking position in a rally after your opponent has served what seems like a really effective short backspin serve. When someone serves short with backspin, if you push it, you get attacked, it can be very difficult. And if you try and flick the ball with a normal flick, it can be very difficult because it's got backspin, so it's often going into the net. So that's why the backhand sidespin flick has become really popular. It allows you to get under the ball, flick it with sidespin. Not only does it allow you to attack it, it also curves with sidespin and makes it hard for your opponent to attack that ball. So you'll see players step right around to their forehand side to utilise this backhand side spin flick because it's so effective. So I want you this week to get out there and practice the backhand side spin flick and then use it in a match situation. Our drill of the week this week is really three separate drills to help you implement the tip of the week, which is to utilise the backhand side spin flick in a game. So drill one is get someone to feed you multi-ball with backspin just short so you can just work over and over. And often people come around to their forehand to utilise it so you might want to get them to play it to your forehand. And just work on getting the side spin backhand flick happening. If you need more tips on how to execute this stroke, look at our backhand side spin flick tutorial. Drill number two is to get the same person to serve short backspin serves to you. And again, play the backhand side spin flick until you can get it right. And drill number three is to continue with the serving, but this time do maybe 80% to where I'm going to play the backhand side spin flick off a backspin ball, and the other 20% can be served anywhere. This just gets me more focused on the serve and brings it closer to a match situation. So short one, I try and play my backhand side spin flick, and then I'm ready for the next one where I wasn't quite, so I've just got to get my focus a little bit better. That was better. I just need to be a bit more focused. And you can see this really makes the drill a lot more difficult. For Remember When this week, we're going back a few decades to see how sport can unify people and countries. The year was 1991 and the Korean Peninsula was in turmoil. They decided that it was going to be a way to unify North and South Korea through sport. Table tennis, being so big in both North and South Korea, was chosen as the sport. The teams were, were combined at the World Championships in Chiba. So what happened? The ultimate story. The Korean women's team ended up beating China. China was going for their ninth consecutive World Women's Teams Championship. But the Korean team, combined in strength and in mind eventually, was able to overcome the might of the, of the mighty Chinese players. I was lucky enough to be there in 1991 playing at the World Championships. And I just remember vividly the crowds that were there supporting Korea. They had basically imported the crowds as well and there were set up cheer squads all around the huge stadium in Chiba. There were cheer squad leaders in each of the sections um, getting the, the crowd to chant and the, the, the atmosphere was just absolutely incredible. They really lifted that combined Korean women's team over the line to a victory that was, at the start of the tournament, very improbable. But by the end, 
it was almost the natural way that it was going to fall because of the, the, the push from politically, but also the crowd in the stadium just almost carried them over the line. It was a fantastic experience to be there and to see what sport can do to combine countries and people from around the world to really lift themselves and to be as one. If you want to find out more about this event, in 2012 it was made into a South Korean movie called As One. Thanks so much for watching this week's show. It's brought to you by PingSkills, so make sure you go to pingskills.com and check out all the great tutorials we have on table tennis. Hopefully we can help you improve your game. The music from today's show was Brontosaurus by Topher Moore and Alex Alana from the YouTube Audio Library. Once again, thanks for watching and until next time, keep enjoying your table tennis.